All right, Psalms for Beginners. This is lesson number 10. We're going to be discussing praise psalms. Praise psalms. You know, one of the interesting features of our study of the psalms is learning about the various types of psalms that there are. Uh, I think most folks who only have a passing knowledge of the psalms, they usually think that all psalms are praise psalms. But we have learned that uh, there are you know, many different types and categories of psalms that include, and I'll do this one more time here, wisdom psalms, nature psalms, the one that extol the, the beauty of the creation, word of God psalms that talk about the power and the beauty uh, of, the, uh, of God's word, penitential psalms, uh, writers who are repenting of sin and confessing their sins to God, worship psalms, talking about the experience of worship, suffering psalms, kind of self-explanatory there, assurance psalms, you know, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, that's an assurance psalm. And then tonight we're going to talk about praise psalms, and then there are royal psalms, which I'll do next time. So in this next lesson, we're going to talk about praise psalms. There are 21 praise type psalms in the book of Psalms. And praise psalms are usually subdivided into two types. First type of praise psalms are declarative, declarative praise psalms. These include, there are 11 of them, Psalm 18, 21, 30, 32, 34, Psalm 40, 41, 66, 106, 116, and 138. Those are the praise psalms, uh, declarative type praise, 11 of those. They're often referred to as thanksgiving or toda, toda psalms, T-O-D-A-H, toda. Toda is the Hebrew word for thanksgiving. So if you hear, oh, that's a toda psalm, meaning it's a thanksgiving psalm. Uh, declarative praise psalms are further divided into two other groups. Praise for the individual, declarative praise uh, of the individual rather, or declarative praise of the community. Now there isn't a big difference between these other than the single or the plural identity of the ones offering the praise. For example, in Psalm 118 verses one to three. This is an individual declarative praise psalm. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Uh, we have a, a very uh, popular or familiar hymn that uses some of this. So there's the individual declar no, declarative. The individual writer is declaring praise, but he himself is the one offering the praise. All right? And then you have the um, communal praise, an example of this, Psalm 66. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth, sing the glory of His name. Make His uh, praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. Uh, to you. They will sing praises to your name, Selah. And so here, this is a communal, declarative praise. The author is encouraging the community, encouraging everyone, not just himself, but everyone to offer praise to God and he gives reasons for that. Um, so declarative praise, whether they're individual or communal, they, like many other types of Psalms, they have their own elements and here they are. Declarative praise usually begin with a proclamation to praise God. So the psalm will begin with a clear intention to praise God. You know right away what this psalm is about because the writer says it right off the bat. I'm going to praise God. I'll show you an example in a minute. The psalmist, as I said, will tell what God has done. And then there will be a vow to praise 
uh, and that vow, excuse me, to praise may have been made in private. In other words, the author may have said, you know, if you do this for me, God, if you get me out of trouble, I will praise your name forevermore. I will do this and I will do that. The promise is made maybe in private, but the fulfillment of the promise is made in public. He calls on people to praise uh, God. The vow is made, uh, the vow is fulfilled in public. So this type of psalm, declarative, you know, um, is um, a kind of a testimony, an example, Psalm 30, one and two. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. Right away, boom, line number one. I will extol you, I'm going to offer praise. Declares right away what he's going to do. And have not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. So his intention, you know, I'm going to praise. And a witness, he makes a witness. I cried out to you and you healed me. I asked you for help and you gave me that help. There's the witness that he makes. Another example, Psalm 116. He says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord Oh, may it be in the presence of all of his people. So here he makes a vow in private. What shall I, you know, he says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Well, what am I going to do? What vow am I going to make? And he answers, I shall lift up the cup. In other words, I'm going to praise. And not only am I going to praise all by myself, he says, uh, or may it be in the presence of all of his people. So I'll fulfill my vow, but I'll fulfill it in front of all the people. So a vow and a public declaration. So the first element is a proclamation to praise God for various reasons. That's one of the elements in a declarative praise psalm. A second element in this type of psalm is a report of deliverance. The praise is given first, right? I will praise, I will extol. Okay, the praise is given first. And then the psalmist will tell what God has done by looking back at what God has done to save or deliver him. So the usual pattern is, I cried out to God, He heard my cry, God drew me out and He saved me. So let's look at this pattern being developed in Psalm 18. All right. The cords of death encompassed me and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of shale surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help before him came into his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went out of his nostrils and fire from his mouth devoured coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He, uh, and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered His voice. Hailstones and coals of fire, He sent out His arrows and scattered them and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of water appeared and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, He sent from on high, He took me, He drew me out of many waters, He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth into a broad place. He rescued me because He delighted in me. So there you have, you know, I cried out to God, I was in trouble. And then the, the biggest part of this particular Psalm he heard my cry, and in this, the uh, author compares God to a mighty power that comes out of the sky, and you know, there's fire and wind, and you know, all imagery 
of um, a powerful God, uh, powerful to the extent that he overpowers the enemies that were afflicting uh, the author. And then in the last couple of lines, right, uh, God draws him out of trouble. He saves him, right? They confronted me, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth. So there's the pattern right there. A cry for help, a description of the power of God and how he uh, comes to the rescue. And then at the end, uh, the deliverance of the, um, of the uh, individual. So uh, you have a proclamation of praise. You have a report of deliverance. That's another feature. A third feature is um, praise and a renewed vow of praise. So there's a renewal of praise. There's the declaration of the many saving acts of God, for example. Let's go to verse 18. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who executes vengeance for me and subdues, uh, subdues people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. Surely you lift me above those who rise up against me. You rescue me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. So he begins, you know, the, the idea of, he begins with praise, talks about what God has done, and then he makes a second vow. He renewed, I used to praise you, I, 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 I cried out to you for help, you came in and you saved me, and now I will continue praising you. I make another vow, and that is to continue, uh, continue praising you. So declarative praise, right? Elements, a proclamation, a report of the deliverance, praise and a renewed vow of praise, and then a fourth element, instruction. Here the author will provide a teaching or an exhortation based on his experience with God. So let's take a look at Psalm 138 to, uh, to uh, notice uh, this particular element. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing praises to you before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. So here he begins with the intention to praise. He doesn't start by praising, he begins by saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to praise, I'm going to praise God. All right. In verses two and three, he's going to give the reason for the praise. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. On the day I called, you answered me, you made me bold with strength in my soul. So there's the reason for the intention of praise. God answered his prayer by strengthening his inward man, his spirit. You, know, you made me bold with strength in my soul. So David does not describe the actual danger here or the challenge that he faced. Only the fact that in his time of need, God provided him with the inner strength to face or to endure or to overcome what he was facing. And so the channel of this blessing or the answered prayer was not the strength of God or sending him you know, power to overcome enemies, no, no. The way that God delivered him from the problems that he was having was through his word. He gave him insight. He comforted him with the word. So David praises God for strengthening him to face a real world challenge by enlarging or deepening his understanding of God's word in some way. And sometimes that's the answer we're looking for. Sometimes it's not always, you know, I want to feel better, I want more money, I want this, I want that. No, sometimes it's, it's simply, I want to know more of what you have to say about this particular thing. I want to understand more what you think, Lord. I've been busy talking to you and telling you my problems. Maybe I need to be quiet so that I can hear what it is you're trying to say to me. <laughs> A lot of times that's the problem. Too much talk on our part, not enough listening. So in verses four to six, 
here's the vow he makes and the instruction that he gives based on his experience. Verse four to six. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth and they will sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord, for though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. So others, kings, people in high places, they will also praise God because of his word. Because God's word is useful not just to the small and the poor man, but he's useful also to the king and to the ruler as well. And so he makes a promise here to proclaim God's word to other people so they can share in the blessings that come from knowing God's word. And then he finishes with an insight and a teaching about God's character, and that is God raises the humble and He lowers the proud. Now that's not the only place that this is taught, this idea, but that, that's the instructional part of this particular uh, psalm. And so there's one more part, and that is renewed praise in this psalm, verse seven and eight. He says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. I like that idea. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you're going to get me out of trouble. Uh-uh, you know what he said. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, uh, you're going to take care of all my pro, uh, no. No, he says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hand. So there's the renewed praise. The author renews his confidence that what the Lord did for him in the past, he can do again for him in the future. So in these final verses, we get an idea of what provoked the author to go to God in prayer in the first place. Some kind of threat presented by his enemies. And yet it wasn't a military answer that David received. He didn't get you know, 10,000 troops from one of the tribes to come in and help him out. What he received was an insight, an encouragement. You know, sometimes, sometimes what we need is just to be reassured. I can handle the trouble. My problem is I'm a little shaky about your love, Lord, or I'm, I'm just not sure that I'm okay with you. I, I'll take care of the trouble. If I'm sure I'm okay with you, Lord, if I'm confident that, that I'm still in your hands, then I, I can manage the, the trouble. And this was somewhat the idea here. He needed strengthening on the inside. All right, so those are declarative praise psalms. The other type, descriptive type, praise psalms. These praise psalms are similar to declarative praise psalms, but they have certain elements that set them apart. These psalms, there are less of these, Psalm 28, 36, 105, 111, 113, 117, 135 and 6, 146 and 147. Those are the descriptive praise psalms. The main difference between these and declarative praise psalms is that they contain more information as to why the praise is given and what it is about God that draws the praise. Ergo, they are called descriptive type. <laughs> you get more information. This is why I'm praising you. Whereas the declarative, here's the praise, Lord. Here's the praise. Let, let me praise you and you know, let me say a lot of things about how wonderful you are. Declarative praise, I declare. Descriptive, let me, let me explain all the reasons why I praise you. And so in the same way as we saw with declarative praise psalms, um, descriptive praise psalms contain the following elements. A prologue, um, hallelujah, or praise be to God. Psalm 111, for example. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. There it is, right there. Hallelujah, spontaneous praise right off the bat. 
Psalm 113, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Again, a spontaneous beginning expression of praise. Next element. Next element is a call for others to join in the praise. Example of this, 117.1, praise the Lord, all nations. Laud Him, all peoples. 135.1, one, another example, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise Him, O servants of the Lord. A call for others to do the same. A kind of a call to worship, if you will. One of the elements of the descriptive praise type. Another element, so a prologue, a call for others to praise, and now the cause for praise. The main body of the Psalms, of these kind of Psalms, usually set forth the reason or reasons God is to be praised. So the author usually puts forth a summary statement of the cause for worship, and this is usually followed up by an example of it. So the summary statement usually has two parts, okay? Uh, one part is God's greatness. He's the Lord of creation, all right? Let's look at a sample of that. Psalm 111, great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is His work and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nation. So note that the author states how wonderful the works of God are, and then he goes on to list several of them, the things that God has done. And so the summary statement, as I say, usually has two parts. One part, God's greatness, the things that He's done. The other part, God's grace, how wonderful God's grace is. Not always in the same psalm, but always one of the two. So in Psalm 36, verse five, your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Notice the synonymous parallelism here. Same thing being said in a different way in the second line. So you have synonymous parallelism in a descriptive praise song. All right, you see it? So how wonderful is God's grace is what he's saying. Another example in uh, 36, 6 to 7, your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like great deep, uh, like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. So the author lists again various blessings obtained by God's grace. Another element of descriptive praise psalms is the conclusion, a conclusion. Once the author has listed the reasons and examples of God's greatness or grace, he then renews his original call for his readers to praise God. So spontaneous praise, hallelujah, praise God. The reasons why described because of his works, because of his mercy, then the conclusion, a call to praise once again. Some examples, 136. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for His loving kindness is everlasting. To Him uh, who alone does great wonders for His um, kindness is everlasting. So here, a call to praise God for both His greatness and His mercy. Uh, let's keep going, uh, verses five and six. He says, to him who made the heavens with skill, for His loving kindness is everlasting, to him who spread out the earth above the waters, for His loving kindness is everlasting, to him who made the great lights, 
for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. You see the play? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you see it, the play. Remember I said he describes why God is great and he also talks about how merciful God is. In this particular Psalm, he, he kind of just you know, goes, he, he mentions one line that says how great God is, and then he continues to repeat, for his loving kindness is everlasting. So there you've got God's greatness, why? God's mercy, except God's mercy is a repeating refrain that, that finds its way throughout the entire psalm. You know, it's not the way we write poetry today. You know, but this is, this is you know, Hebrew style poetry you know, is, is different. It has different elements, okay? Um, in verse, in chapter 136, verses beginning in verse 10, we switch gears. He says, to him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn for his loving kindness is everlasting and brought Israel out from their midst for his loving kindness is everlasting with a strong hand and an outstretched arm for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness is everlasting. But he overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who smote great kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Again. The same pattern over and over. The great things he does and his great mercy. The great things he does and his great mercy. And you can tell this is something meant to be sung, a refrain to be sung, okay? Loses, I think, some of its power if we just read it. But if you sing it, like many songs have a refrain, this becomes a much different and I think a much more powerful, um, uh, a much more powerful vehicle uh, for, for praise and for uh, worship. Uh, then in 130, uh, excuse me, uh, 136, and then in uh, 136, verse 26, I jump to the end, he says, give thanks to the God of heaven for his loving kindness is everlasting. So the conclusion at the end, a renewed call to praise God. Sometimes the conclusion is a general exhortation or a petition or a teaching of some kind. I'll give you an example of that. 111 verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. So this was a descriptive praise psalm, but look at the, doesn't it sound familiar here? For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Isn't there a proverb like that? So there's the instruction there that is inserted in this particular, the, like the last verse of this particular one. Again, the example of the conclusion at the end. And then another element, so we have a prologue, praise God, a call for others to praise God, the reasons for the praise, His greatness, His mercy, a conclusion, an exhortation or a lesson of some kind, and then the epilogue, the author sometimes bookends his poem by placing at the end the same expression he used to begin the psalm. So a good example of this, Psalm 136, verse one and verse 26. So verse one in Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And then the last verse, same thing, give thanks to God of heaven for his loving kindness is everlasting. All right, so praise psalms celebrate God's greatness and mercy in the following ways. First of all, they begin by offering words of praise or calling on others to recognize and to praise God. Secondly, they, they enumerate and describe the things that God has, that God is, and that God will do that are signs of His greatness and His mercy. You know, there's, we don't do it because I think it's hard to do it. Not everybody can speak extemporaneously when they get up. 
you know, if you go to other, if you go to churches in other church, if you go to a Catholic church or you go to, you know, another Protestant denomination, many times the prayers are read. They're read from a book of prayer, certainly in the Catholic, uh, you know, I grew up Catholic, and every day, uh, you know, the prayers for every day are already written. The priest simply reads the prayer for you know, June the 28th. You know, he, he opens, it's called a missal, by the way. His, his personal study book is not the Bible, it's called a missal. He opens his missal up, and in the missal, there's the prayer for June the 28th. 2017, already written, already prepared. And so he simply reads it. As a, as a new Christian, when I, you know, I came out of Catholicism, and as a new, you know, new Testament Christian, I, I was fascinated by the idea that anybody, anybody in the church, got up and led a prayer, which was the exclusive domain of the priest. And they didn't even read a prayer out of a, out of a book or anything. They made it up right on the spot. I found that so amazing. And it is amazing, but not everyone has the skill to be gracious and eloquent in addressing a prayer to God. That's the downside. You know, we tend to, whose turn is it? <laughs> You know, we got a list, I, we got 29 guys who volunteered to pray and everybody gets their turn. And some have, are more gifted, let's put it this way, in this area than, than others. And we say, well, you know, God looks at the heart, true. But if you're leading the prayer on behalf of 400 people, it'd be nice if you had something to say. <laughs> you know? It would be edifying for the other 399 of us if you, if you had given it some thought before getting up. So the advantage of preparing a prayer ahead of time and reading it, well, you know, it might, you know somebody's thought about it. So the reason for the Psalms is that God has given us some words, some ideas, some examples of how to actually praise Him. It would be okay for the man who has the prayer, the opening prayer, uh, and he knows about it. Unfortunately, sometimes you know, we're asked at the last minute, so you know, that, there's where it becomes extemporaneous. But if you know a week ahead of time you're going to lead the, uh, the you know, have an opening prayer for worship, it doesn't hurt to go into the Psalms and to take a look at how did they praise God. I think it would be quite edifying for someone to get up and just say, you know, oh God, you are the God of heaven. You, your works are mighty and great. You know, and to, to follow the pattern of the inspired writers about talking and describing the greatness of God and what He has done. And then perhaps even some personal examples of His mercy. In, in your life. Uh, the point I'm making here with all of this is the Psalms, this is one way that the Psalms helps us, gives us words that we can use if we ourselves are not eloquent. So, all right, so the praise Psalms also, they repeat the exhortation for others to begin or to continue in their praise of God. Keep praising God. And they finish with a teaching or a final word of praise. So let's look at one more, Psalm 135. So of 135, kind of put all of these little elements together here. So he begins in verse one. Praise the Lord. There's the prologue, the hallelujah, the spontaneous praise the Lord. I keep going back to my other thing that I was talking to you about, you know, how wonderful. I, I think it's shyness. I think it's shyness. You know, I'm, I'm just a guessing here, I'm off my nose, but I think it's shyness. You know, we, we might be embarrassed to go before the assembly and say, oh God, how wonderful you are. I'm amazed at the things that you do. I am not worthy, God, to even speak. And only by your mercy can I open my mouth and lift up words of praise before your throne because you are a mighty God, a 
wonderful God, full of power. And, you know, we're embarrassed, I think, to let go. And we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. Praise the Lord, he says. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O servants of God. So there's the prologue. Let's get back into technical mode, shall we? Uh, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to His name, for it is lovely. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for Himself, Israel for His own possession. See the synonymous parallelism right there? Chosen Jacob, Israel for His own possession. So here, the encouragement for others to praise. I get up and I praise, and hey, you over there, you praise God too, let's everybody praise. Then verses five, you'll get here, now he, he's, done the, he's done the prologue, he's done the encouragement for everyone to praise, now he's going to give examples of God, why should we be praising God? So he says, for I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in, in the deeps, He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain, who brings forth the wind from His treasuries. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all of his servants. Uh, he smote many nations and slew mighty kings. Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all of the kingdoms of Canaan, and he gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his people. Your name, O Lord, is everlasting. Your remembrance, O Lord, throughout all generations, for the Lord will judge his people and will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are but silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath at all in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. So there, the examples of His greatness and His mercy. And then he finishes, again with an epilogue, a renewed call to praise God. Verse 19, he says, O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who revere the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem, Praise the Lord. And so he finishes, as I say, with an epilogue, a renewed call to praise God. I come back to my former little uh, tirade, <laughs> if you wish. Praying using this pattern and giving thought to prayer and being bold in prayer is inspiring for the congregation. It lifts up the spirits of those. Why do people come to worship service? They come to be inspired. They, they come to be challenged. They come to be taught. They come to be comforted. And it's the use of God's word that can accomplish all of these things. Remember we said in the very first Psalm, how did God minister to David, right? He strengthened him from the inside. He gave him something to be strong. People come to worship to get something in order to be strong. And, and the way we give that to them is the various ways that we minister the word during worship. Yes, the sermon, but yes, the prayers, and yes, the, the thoughts at the communion, and yes, the words that are sung, and yes, the words of love and fellowship that we share before and after the service, all those things designed specifically by the Holy Spirit in order to strengthen the spirit of the brethren. So I'm just making the case for Psalms. If you're looking for that kind of inspiration, if you're a, song, a prayer leader, male or female, obviously our sisters lead prayers uh, in context, they, if the challenge is the same for them because men and women both are looking for strength and comfort when they worship or have 
small group Bible studies. It's all the same thing. We all want the same thing. Okay, so there's a lesson number 10, praise psalms. Thank you for your attention.